After Julius Caesar died, one of the last major battles of the Roman Civil Wars was between Octavian and Sextus Pompey. The latter, one of Pompey the Great's sons, oversaw a navy fleet in the Mediterranean when Octavian came up against him. In today's video, we're going to talk about this. After the hard clash between Brutus at the Battle of Philippi, it was time to split up the territory that had been won. This led to a new agreement between the members of the Second Triumvirate about where the territory would be. Lepidus, who was the weaker link in this partnership, did well for himself because he was able to take charge of a large part of the Republic's territory in Africa. Mark Antony chose to go east, to Egypt, where he joined forces with Queen Cleopatra, who had been in love with Julius Caesar, and gave birth to Caesarion. He also ran the kingdoms and friends of Rome in the eastern Mediterranean. Gaul and the region of Hispania were left in the hands of Octavian. He didn't have much time to enjoy anything because a major problem had to be addressed. Veterans who had worked for Brutus had joined the Second Triumvirate in large numbers. This was both good and bad because these people could easily combine forces with the political foe of Octavian if they weren't appeased. They were also very demanding, asking for things like land that were valuable. At the same time, Octavian had to figure out where on Italian soil he would put the tens of thousands of heroes on the Macedonian War whom the Triumvirs had promised to spare. But there was no more government-owned land to give his soldiers as homes. Octavian had to choose between making a lot of Roman citizens unhappy by taking their land or making a lot of Roman soldiers disgruntled which could lead to trouble in the Republic. Octavian went with the first choice, establishing new towns near the 18 Roman cities, forcing whole populations to leave their homes. But, as expected, the people did not agree with these measures right away. There was plenty of anger towards Octavian due to how his forces were treated. This made many people want to support Lucius Antonius, who was Mark Antony's brother, and was backed by the majority in the Senate. While another enemy was starting to show up, the power games in Rome were going full speed ahead. Octavian asked his wife, Claudia, for a divorce. This represented another issue, as she was Fulvia's daughter, Mark Antony's first wife. When Octavian got tired of the young woman, he sent Claudia back to her mother, claiming that they had never been married. Fulvia chose to act. In an extremely dangerous move, she and Lucius Antonius put together an army in Italy to fight against Octavian. They oversaw eight legions, a rather considerable force. They moved forward and at first even won some battles. But Lucius and Fulvia forgot an important aspect. The triumvirs still had to pay the wages of the Roman army, and they couldn't afford such prohibitive costs. As such, the confidence of their troops was low and the men never fought to the best of their abilities. Octavian's men surrounded Lucius and his friends near Perusia. Then, in early 40 BC, after a hard winter during which their troops could no longer fight properly and were running out of food, Octavian forced them to give up. But Lucius and his men were saved as they were related to Mark Antony, the most powerful and respected man in the world at the time. But things failed to work out for the plotters in the end, with Fulvia being sent to a Greek city. Octavian was also cruel to Lucius' many friends as the young man decided to set his revenge. On March the 15th, the anniversary of Julius Caesar's death, he killed 300 Roman senators and knights who helped Lucius. Perusia was also burned down to send a message to other places. This bloody event hurt Octavian's image and was criticized by several Roman writers. But this didn't bother Octavian much. He believed that sometimes he had to show how strong and how cruel he was, or else his power would be threatened. As time went on, things settled down a bit, but soon got back to normal. This time, it was because of a man named Pompey, who both Octavian and his adoptive father knew well. Not Pompey the Great, though. After the Battle of Pharsalus, he had been killed in Egypt. But it was his son, Sextus Pompey, who really did it. Even though he held important posts, he turned into a rebel general after Julius Caesar beat his father. After he became immensely powerful, he had a deal with the Second Triumvirate to move to Sicily and Sardinia in 39 BC. But now he was the Golden Goose, so both Mark Antony and Octavian wanted to join forces with him. 
In 40 BC, Octavian married Scribonia, who was the sister of Pompey's father-in-law. This gave him a short-term ally. Just over a year after they got married, Octavian's only natural daughter, Julia, was born to his new wife. Ironically, she gave birth to Julia on the same day he left her to marry Livia Drusilia. In Egypt, Antony began having an affair with Cleopatra, with whom he had twin boys. Albeit happy there, he was worried. He knew that his relationship with Octavian could not last forever and would get worse at some point. So, he chose to do something to stop that from happening. Antony left Cleopatra and went to Italy in 40 BC with a major army to fight Octavian. There, he quickly put Brundisium under siege. But this clash didn't go extremely far, as both Octavian and Antony couldn't handle the new conflict. Their centurions, who had become important political players, wouldn't fight a Caesarian cause. While Antony was on his way to see his wife, Fulvia, she suddenly got sick and died. Fulvia's death and the rebellion of his centurions made it possible for the two surviving triumvirates to get along, at least in the short term. Having achieved peace in the fall of 40 BC, the two most powerful men in the world signed the Treaty of Brundisium, which was meant to make the second trio stronger once more. Lepidus would stay in Africa, Antony would stay in the east, and Octavian would stay in the west. The Italian peninsula was left open so that anyone could find forces there, which did not help Antony very much. And, on top of all of that, in late 40 BC, Octavian set up a marriage between his sister, Octavia, and his worst enemy to strengthen his partnership with Antony. Peace had been made once again. Like always, it would end soon after. As Sextus Pompey's power grew, he chose to threaten Octavian by stopping grain from being sent across the Mediterranean Sea to the Italian peninsula. This was Pompey's plan to cause a general famine in the areas where Octavian was in charge. It is important to note that he had good reason to be confident enough to face Octavian. By this time, he had put together a strong army and a fleet of large boats. Many of his father's slaves and friends, as well as what was left of the Optimates, joined his cause in the hope of saving the Roman Republic, which was quickly becoming an autocratic kingdom. Many slaves who joined Sextus were from the patricians' towns. In short, he wasn't just another rival. Octavian chose to talk as he had many problems to solve. The Pact of Mycenaeum was made in 39 BC. It ended Pompey's ban of trade, and in exchange, he was given control of Sardinia, Corsica, Sicily, and the Peloponnese. But it wouldn't be like this for long. After a fleeting time, the deal between the Triumvirate and Sextus Pompey about the land started to fall apart. On January the 17th, 38 BC, Octavian divorced Scribonia and married Livia. One of Pompey's navy leaders turned on him and gave Corsica and Sardinia to Octavian, which made their relationship even worse. But Octavian knew he had to get help. He realized that his troops didn't have enough means to fight Pompey on their own. So, he made a deal that made the second triumvirate last for another five years, from 37 BC. He also started getting ready for the coming war by telling his friend Marcus Agrippa to arrange plans. Then, Agrippa cut off part of the Via Arcalana and dug a tunnel to connect Lucrine Lake to the sea. This was done to turn it into a port called Portus Julius. Ships were taught how to fight at sea at the new port. There was a new fleet made up of 20,000 rowers and freed slaves. The new vessels were made much bigger so that they could carry more marine infantry teams that were being trained at the time. Mark Antony also chose to help at that moment, but it was clear that it wasn't out of kindness. He wanted to get support for his own war against the Parthian Empire to get revenge for Rome's loss at Carhe in 53 BC. Then at Tarentum, another deal was made. Antony gave Octavian 120 ships to use against Pompey, and Octavian was to send 20,000 soldiers against Parthia to be used by Antony. But Octavian only sent a tenth of what he said he would, which Antony considered an insult. Despite their problems and differences, they were ready to fight. So, in July the 36 BC, two fleets left Italy, and the other triumvir Lepidus sent a third fleet from Africa to attack Pompey's base in Sicily. Agrippa, a friend of Octavian, met Pompey's forces at Nolicus. Both fleets had 300 ships with artillery, but Agrippa's were bigger and stronger. 
They were armed with the Harpex, a Roman catapult-style hook that could catch an enemy ship and then pull it alongside for boarding. And the Corvus, a kind of bridge with a metal tip that could be thrown onto the deck of an enemy ship. When the Romans tied the two ships together, they could use them as bases for fighting. When the battle started, Agrippa halted Sextus's more maneuverable ships. After a long and bloody encounter, he was able to beat his enemy. Three of his ships were lost, but 28 of Sextus Pompey's vessels were sunk, 17 escaped, and the rest were burned or taken. It was a victory for Octavian, but it didn't make up for the fact that, in the same month, he lost a fight near Taormina and was badly hurt. Lepidus, on the other hand, got most of his army to land and then destroyed the heart of Sicily. In 36 BC, Sextus ran away from it and went to Miletus. In 35 BC, Marcus Titius, an ally of Mark Antony, caught and killed him without a hearing. This was against the law because he was a Roman citizen who had the right to a trial. They had won, but as usual, this did not stop them from playing for power. The triumvir's rising mistrust got worse as soon as the Pompeian rebellion was over for good. This was clear when Octavian went to Lepidus' camp, and the men there praised him as Caesar's son. Lepidus then did something risky by pushing his friend out of the camp. This happened because Lepidus and Octavian accepted Pompey's troop surrender, with Lepidus believing he could claim Sicily for himself. It didn't work out. A large portion of Lepidus' army went over to Octavian's side because they were tired of war and because the young Caesar's son promised them money. Octavian accused a weak Lepidus of taking over power in Sicily and trying to start a revolt. This gave him the footing he needed to get rid of Lepidus for good, which was something he had wanted to do for a long time. Lepidus was humiliated and had no chance of winning. He surrendered and lost his position in the triumvirate but he was allowed to keep his title as Pontifex Maximus, overseeing all the priests. His time in the public eye was over, and he moved to a house on Cape Circeo in Italy. After that, Octavian oversaw the west, and Antony oversaw the east. With the former's help, the people of Rome managed to have peace and security in their part of the kingdoms by keeping their property rights. And, to avoid the problems that came up after he beat Brutus, he settled the troops he had dismissed outside of Italy. At the same time, Octavian sent back 30,000 slaves to their former Roman owners. These slaves had run away to join Pompey's army and navy, which was another way he showed he was strong and resolute. After another victory, Octavian felt strong and confident, but he still asked the Senate for protection from court, or sancro santitas, for himself, his wife, and his sister. This was to make sure that he, Livia, and Octavia would be safe when he went back to Rome. But something more important was about to happen. After many years of being forced to work together, which was uncomfortable and hard to understand, Octavian and Mark Antony were about to break up in a fight that would change the course of the Roman Republic and the whole of the Western world. If you liked this video, don't forget to like it and subscribe to the channel. See you in the next video.